we have the late breaking Jeff Kloon here to talk with us about whatever he's gonna talk about. So hello everybody, my name is Jeff Kloon. I am one of the lonely souls that was wandering in the desert working on neural nets in the mid 2000s that Bart was referring to. Um, and I'm going to talk to you today about uh, a lot of similar topics actually. There's a lot of overlap with what we just saw. Hopefully this works. But it is a different take and so I hope it will be useful for you. I also want to apologize to anyone who saw my talk in Jackson about a year ago because this talk is extremely similar to that one. Take this out. All right, I'm going to wander around. So um, thank you all for coming. It's uh, fantastic to see you. I am going to talk about um, artificial intelligence and some of the implications it has for society. I also want to, as Bart did in his excellent talk, uh, summarize some of these concepts for you since I know a lot of people here are not necessarily ramped up in them in terms of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning, their capabilities and the effects that they might have on society. So uh, briefly, a little bit about myself. I'm an associate professor at the University of Wyoming where I direct the Evolving Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, which the governor of Wyoming was uh, kind enough to visit a few years ago. I also, uh, with some colleagues, had a startup that I helped lead called Geometric Intelligence and it was acquired by Uber uh, about a year and a half ago to form Uber's Artificial Intelligence Laboratories. And obviously at Uber, we have a tremendous amount of fascinating machine learning problems. Uh, Bart mentioned driverless cars. We also have the challenge of traffic prediction and fraud detection and safety and moving millions of people through thousands of cities around the world every single day, which is uh, a formidable machine learning challenge. So it's a great opportunity. Um, so, what do we mean by artificial intelligence? Bart has already given you a lot of overview of what we mean. Uh, at a very high level though, I like to think about it as just trying to make computers as smart as possible, including making them smarter than humans in any dimensions that we find fit to do that. And so I think that's a wake-up call to think about um, and take computers not as in, you know, the intelligence that we see in current applications, but uh, where they might go in terms of being superhuman in many dimensions. So uh, here are many, many different examples of AI deployed in the world. My plane that I rode here on flew itself most of the way. Soon the car that I drive here in will also drive itself. Uh, we've heard about IBM Watson. We've heard about uh, Go and chess playing. We also are increasingly seeing robots walking around the world and playing games, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and Bart did a good job of talking about what AI is good at and not good at. I'm going to do a little bit of the same. <clears throat> My one general rule is that whatever is easy for AI is very hard for humans and vice versa. That's the current state of affairs. So computers are exceptionally good at multiplying very large numbers, which I am terrible at. Uh, they are good at doing the same thing over and over and over again. I also am terrible at that. Uh, they play chess. They can manipulate symbols according to well-defined rules, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Humans find a lot of these challen very challenging. In contrast, things that we do not even think about, we don't find hard in the least, and a one-year-old can do, computers have found historically to be exceptionally difficult. So seeing that there's a dog, a bike, and a car in this image, walking through a field in Wyoming, hearing the sounds that I'm making and knowing what words that I'm speaking, and manipulating objects such as making a salad are tremendously difficult historically for computers. However, as Bart mentioned, one technology in recent years, since about 2012, has really changed the state of affairs for these kind of tasks. Bart referred to them as perception, and he's right, because you're processing perceptual information, seeing and understanding the world. And that technology is deep learning. And just to situate you, deep learning is a subset of machine, and, uh, machine learning, and machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence. So oftentimes you hear these words used interchangeably, but this is kind of the lay of the land. There are AI techniques that are not deep learning, quite a few of them actually. So deep learning has been the main driver of recent advances and probably everything you've been reading about and hearing about in the media over the last couple of years has been about deep learning. So at a core, deep learning can be thought of as just a, ver a computational process that takes some input and gives you some output. 
very generally. So imagine, for example, a computational brain here that takes this image and says lion, <coughs> or takes some, la um, some Latin and translates that into English. And the uh, general idea is that you, know, you want the computer to see and understand the world, but I want to impress upon you how hard this task is. To a computer, a picture is just a thousand or a million numbers. So imagine sitting down and writing a program that would look at a book of a million numbers and say, aha, that's a scuba diver behind a turtle. That is a fantastically difficult challenge, and that is what AI is challenged with. But not only is that hard, imagine having that program also recognize all of these images as scuba divers, and not only do that, but generalize to recognizing new pictures of scuba divers it's never seen before. It's remarkably difficult, and humans have no idea how to write a program to do this. Instead, we write programs that learn to do this on their own from data, and that's what deep learning is. So here in 2012, this is an advance that Bart referred to. This was by Hinton and his students. They had a deep neural net that was trained on images, millions of them, and then it would be able to look at that and say, that's a ladybug, and my second guess is that's a snail. Here, it, th it actually gets it wrong. It thinks this is a field of sunflowers, and you can kind of see why it does that, but its second guess is that it's a field of pumpkins, which, of course, is correct. Nowadays, computers are better than humans on narrow tasks at recognizing these sorts of images, which is just a sea change for what was even thought conceivable in 2011, for example. So how does it work? As Bart mentioned, I'm going to go into a little bit more of the details. So in your brain are these things called neurons, and they take input from other neurons. These are incoming connections that come into the cell of a neuron. And then if they fire, then they send a signal down to other neurons that are downstream. And that signal may, ca may cause the other neurons to either fire or not fire. And which neurons are connected to which and how strongly governs whether or not you like USA Today or Shakespeare, whether or not you prefer ballet to football, who you fall in love with, and whether or not you prefer chocolate to vanilla to strawberry. These networks of neurons make up all of the computation that is you. So computer scientists abstract this in the notion of a neural network, which are effectively just these nodes here, which are called neurons. They're wired up to other neurons. And they can fire and inhibit or excite downstream neurons. And it's up to the learning algorithm to set these weights, how strongly each neuron is connected to each other neuron, to produce the computation that does all the amazing things that deep learning does. So here is an example of a network. You literally put each of these pixels on an input neuron here. You run it through these layers of neural neurons. And at the output, you want it to light up the lion neuron if it's looking at a lion. And, we just and the way that we train these networks is giving them lots of images. But I want to point out that this neural network here looks very complicated and has, that it has a lot of weights to set. But actually, by, it's puny by modern standards. Starting in around 2012, we entered the world of deep neural nets, which means having many layers of neurons. And they have somewhere between 650 layers, a million neurons, and 100 million connections which is still smaller than the human brain, but soon we'll have ones, similar uh, versions of these that are as computationally powerful as the human brain, at least in terms of the number of connections. So here's how we train them, and this is the most technical part of the talk. Uh, you take a neural net, and now I flipped it vertically. You start with the image, you put it in, you run it through all these layers of neurons here, and at the very end, it has a neuron for each class that we're interested in, in the case of vision. And the current neural net might, in response to this image, output these numbers here, which says that a dog is the most likely uh, classification for this lion. And the, all we do is we change the network somewhat in a way to make it more likely next time to say lion and less likely to say every other thing except lion. How do we do that? Well, it turns out that this is just a giant math equation if you unroll all the math behind the neural net. And therefore, we can use simple calculus to calculate the derivative of every single weight, how to change each weight to make it a little bit more likely next time to say lion and not dog. And then we just repeat that process over and over and over again. Here, for example, on a car. That's it. That's the magic of deep learning. It works tremendously well. So, why they work is that they tend to automatically learn features that they can detect in the world and then hierarchically compose those features into increasingly abstract, complex uh, uh, 
uh, concepts. So for example, if we put in my friend Joel here in, as a picture, the first layer of the neural net will recognize the edges in the picture, then the second or higher levels might put edges together into corners and then noses and then eyes, and then layers above them will say, aha, I see two Joel eyes and a Joel nose, that must be Joel Lehman, or maybe it recognizes myself or somebody else. And that not only works in vision, but any possible data. So imagine that you're in speech, you're recognizing phonemes, and then words, and then clauses, and then sentences, et cetera, et cetera. So what this does is it requires tremendous amounts of computation to just churn through all of these examples and learn to say lion when you see a lion. And I want to give a hat tip here to Wyoming and the people in Wyoming who invested heavily in com uh, high performance computing very early. And these centers here, especially this one, have powered all of the research that I've been able to do at the University of Wyoming. And it's essential to have cutting edge computing facilities to innovate and compete because computation is an essential ingredient to advances in in this field. I also want to point out that these systems, however, are starting to get aged and need to be replaced because in the computing world, things age fast, and if you want to stay at the cutting edge, you have to be constantly investing. But these things throw off jobs and opportunities and technologies and startups, and so I think they're worth every penny. There's an exponential growth of computing that we just heard about, and soon we will be at the, uh, at the pr uh, ability to kind of simulate the power of a human brain, and then we will go beyond that, and it won't take too long before we do. So, what can deep neural nets do? We've heard a little bit about it. I'm going to tell you a little bit more. As Bart said, for the first time, they can see and understand the world around us, and that is just a game changer. So they can look in this image here and detect every single object in that image and tell you what it is. They can also describe what they see in a picture. So they say that, look at the picture behind me and say, that's a girl in a pink dress jumping in the air, or a black and white dog jumping over a blue bar, etc. Again, none of this was possible a few years ago. I just want to t point out one example that we've done in my lab at the University of Wyoming, which is that we decided to try to help out people who want to study animals by deploying motion sensor cameras in the wild in natural ecosystems so they can automatically see how many wildebeest are there, how many lions are there, are they hunting, are they sleeping, who are they hanging out with, how many kids do they have. So my colleagues at Oxford and Harvard and the University of Minnesota Minnesota have deployed these cameras in the wild, but the problem is that they just take millions and millions of pictures. Most of them are empty because the grass is blowing and that's triggering motion sensor. But even if you have just the animals, that's still millions and millions of images. So how do you go from this set of millions of images to a count of how many lions are in this certain patch of the Serengeti? Well, what they've had to do is rely on humans. So they recruited armies, literally 50,000 volunteer citizen scientists who go onto a website and say like lion, zebra, giraffe, baboon, etc. They've put in over 17,000 collective hours of their time labeling images manually. So I challenged one graduate student Arash Naruzadeh, to see if he could automate what the work that army of 50,000 people did. And in the, in, over the course of a year or two of research, we found that deep learning can automatically do virtually all of the images that the system is producing. We can automatically label 99.3% of the images at the exact same level of, that the humans can do this task at which is incredible. So the first 3.2 million images took 50,000 people and 17,000 hours, but the next 3.2 million and the next and the next and the next are all effectively free because of the one neural net that we've trained that use those labels. So this is work that will be on the cover of the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in about a week or two, which we're tremendously excited about. Uh, we also want to use this technology to help scientists throughout the world. For example, in Wyoming, we currently count and census uh, the number of animals that we have by flying around in helicopters and going one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That is slow, it is error prone, and it is dangerous because these helicopters can crash. It's also very expensive. So Matt Kaufman, who runs the co-op unit at the University of Wyoming, is deploying camera traps on mi migration corridors, and we're working with him to automatically assess which kind of animals are going by, by and how many are going by, which we think is very profitable. I'm also working with a lot of people on anti-poaching efforts, on conservation, and protecting endangered species. All of this becomes cheaper and easier once you can automatically see and understand the world with computers. 
Bart mentioned driverless cars. Here's a video of a driverless car that's automatically labeling every single picture, pixel in the image as to whether or not it is a safe place to drive, a pedestrian, a biker, a tree, a traffic sign, et cetera. That's essential and difficult. Uh, AI is increasingly better than doctors at recognizing tumors and broken bones, at looking uh, in security film and saying who is entering my airport or my uh, subway. You can use it to optimize traffic flow through a retail store, figure out what people are picking up, looking at, and then putting down. Maybe you need to change your packaging in that situation. You can automatically recognize where your herd of cows are. And I love this example. You could fly a drone over your crops and see which crops need to be watered or are diseased and might need to be sprayed with some sort of uh, insecticide or uh, medicine or whatever it is. Uh, robots can also learn from human demonstrations. So increasingly, we will teach them the tasks that we want them to perform. Here are researchers at Google that showed a robot how to open a door, and it learned to imitate that. Researchers at NVIDIA just had a deep neural net watch humans drive for a while. Did nothing else except that, put the deep neural net in charge of the, the car, took their hands off the wheel, and now this car can drive around the road and let you take selfies or whatever you want to do. Uh, and obviously, this will have profound implications for the transportation sector. All of the truck drivers in coal mines and in fact that are mowing lawns and uh, you know, harvesting crops, the long haul trucking industry, all of those jobs are now on the chopping block because AI can automate that task and probably do it safer and certainly do it cheaper once they are as good as human drivers. We've also heard about uh, AI that not only can imitate humans, but can learn on its own how to, how to do tasks. So this is called reinforcement learning. It's kind of trial and error learning. It's how you and I learn a lot of tasks. So the researchers at DeepMind learned, placed deep neural nets in front of computers, and they could learn to play arbitrary video games just by trying to make the score go up. They figured out the rules, how to, what motions they should make, et cetera. Uh, they learned how to play Go, and researchers that I'm collaborating with at the University of Berkeley have figured out how to make robots automatically learn like children do to put blocks into, uh, you know, solve kind of these kids' games. For example, here is an example of a robot through trial and error learning, figuring out how to put a, a certain shape into the right hole. Now, I want to point out, they are not as good as humans. They are far less efficient at learning. So you can see all the red paint here on this wooden box as the robot continuously makes error after error after error after error. It's much slower at learning this task than my two-year-old. However, in the end, it does do it. And then it would do it endlessly and without pay, right? So there are some trade-offs. Uh, if you've ever thought to yourself, I wish I could be in many places at once so I could learn eight times faster, for example. I have that thought every single minute. Uh, well, you're not in luck. You can't do that. But AI can do that, and that gives it an advantage over us. So here are eight or 12 robots simultaneously picking up objects and then sharing the knowledge. So there's really one brain learning with eight arms doing the same task over and over again. So I wish I could read eight books at once. DNNs can also read, DNNs stands for deep neural nets, can also read text and understand it. And this is incredible. So a deep neural net fed with this story on the left can then answer these questions with these answers. So increasingly, you will have AI read articles for you and books for you, and then you will ask questions of it. You know, students will not, no longer have to pay for Cliff Notes. They'll just ask for the summary and then ask a few follow-up questions, and then they're good to go for your exams. Um, DNNs can also hear the sounds that I'm making and turn them into the words that I'm speaking. If any of you use that feature on your phone where you text by voice, then you're already using a deep neural net that's in your phone, and that powers Alexa and Siri. Uh, and increasingly, they can converse. Actually, sorry, hold on. I want to use audio here. It's over here. So this is research that came out of Google just a couple of weeks ago. Let's see if this works. Can you hear? Can I help you? Hi, I'm calling to book a woman's haircut for a client. Can you turn that up? I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure. All right, that's a good idea. Let's take that out. That is turn it up. And try it again. So how can I help you? Hi, I'm calling to book a women's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm-hmm. Sure, what time are you looking for around? 
at 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 115. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like, what service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's her first name? The first name is Lisa. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. Have a great day. Bye. One of those two participants was AI. Do you know which one? Maybe both. No, in, in this particular case, one of them was AI. I find that absolutely mind-boggling. It's hard to tell which is which. The cognition behind choosing what to say and when to say it, as well as the voice itself, were both synthetically generated by artificial systems. This is an example of translation that Bart mentioned. So you can uh, point your phone at signs and they will automatically translate them for you. You can text and it will translate. And this is the demonstration he mentioned, a live demo on Skype where you can talk to somebody in German where you're saying English, they're speaking in German, and the system automatically will uh, do the translation for you. So the language barriers of the world will melt away. This was science fiction in Douglas Adams decades ago, and now I actually don't think I need to have my kids learn a second language because by the time they're traveling the world and they're backpacking, there will be a babble fish in their ear which will make zero language barriers with every single person they encounter. This is work out of my lab at the University of Wyoming with some fantastic collaborators, including Jason Yozinski and Ang Nguyen, who's now a professor at the University of Auburn, uh, or Auburn University. Uh, these are images created by a deep neural net. And in fact, Ang sent me, one of these blocks of images is fake and one of them is real. And when Ang first sent me them, I actually thought he was sending me real images and he was sending me synthetically generated images. And I could not tell the difference between them. Can you? Can you tell which is real and which is fake? This is a deep neural net walking around the space of volcanoes, telling you all of the different things it thinks a volcano looks like. Sometimes it's erupting, sometimes it has a blue sky, sometimes it's at night, sometimes it has a glacier below or uh, grass below. It can kind of walk around the platonic concept of what it means to be a volcano and show you everything that it thinks a volcano is. We can similarly generate fake birds, ants, monasteries, whatever we want. The deep neural nets can also be creative, so we challenge them to make art for us, and they come up with these artistic interpretations of what it means to be in a prison cell, or a banana, or a cup, or a beacon, or a chain link fence, which I actually think they're just artistically very interesting and beautiful. And we wanted to see whether or not they would pass an artistic Turing test and be accepted on their own merits as art. So we submitted them to a University of Wyoming art competition where the art students spend all year on one project, they submit it, hope it gets accepted, and into this uh, competition and hung on the wall of a museum. We submitted these pictures. We did not tell the judges that they were generated by computers as opposed to human art students. And not only were they accepted and hung on the wall of the museum, but they were given an award. Just within Google, there is an exponential explosion of AI being woven into everything that they do. Every single product you see here uses AI, and there are many more that Google's working on that doesn't. Google bet all, went all in on AI a long time ago, and it is completely paying off. I think Wyoming and I think the world should do the same. Here, every single major company is kind of worth their salt, is uh, putting everything they can into AI these days. Uh, IBM reckons it's a true trillion dollar opportunity, and there's over 1,000 startups and five billion in funding, and this number was a few years ago. I bet that number has exponentially exploded since then. It's creating these amazing jobs, as well as taking them away. Modern salaries for people with PhDs are north of $400,000. Other people are being paid salaries better than NFL players. Universities are competing with companies to hold on to anyone who knows anything about deep learning. Uh, and so there are opportunities as well as costs in terms of the jobs being created. So, uh, but we're here to talk a little bit about the threats. So I will briefly mention that. Uh, but before I do, I wanna talk about what's the right metaphor for this AI thing? Is it a, the next computing revolution? Just as there was PC and then internet, social, and mobile, is AI the next one? I think that's right. Andrew Ng has gone further and he says that AI is actually the next electricity. That he cannot think of any industry that won't be massively changed and disrupted by AI, and I agree with him. So, 
More example opportunities are everywhere. Here are some. You could imagine AI that does recognizes uh, attacks. You can imagine it handling your customer service, as we just heard in that phone dialogue, doing your marketing for you, both optimizing campaigns, maybe optimizing the pictures and the ads themselves to customize to you, and also maybe, maybe making outbound phone calls, salespeople, medical diagnoses, treatment, bioinformatics, looking through my genome for problems and associating it with disease, flying cars, picking stocks, uh, lawyers. There are a lot of lawyers were paid a lot of money to read through endless troves of emails and look, for example, for the smoking gun in the Enron case. Increasingly, you'll have an AI that just reads it all, and then you ask it, will you show me all the sensitive emails that I might be interested in for this case? And it will say, here are the 15 of these 70,000 documents that you really want to pay attention to. Energy optimization, I mean, and this is everything. There's just no re nothing I can't think of where AI will make a big difference. So obviously, we're here this weekend to talk about threats. There will be jobs jobs that will be lost for sure. There will also be jobs that will be created. Here are the jobs that are probably the most safe and the least safe. The general rule of thumb is that if your job is predictable if you could, and routine, if you're doing the same thing over and over again, whether or not that's manual labor or cognitive labor, if it's repetitive, you're probably, you should be worried in the near future. If it's anything, you should be worried in the long term. Um, my lab also was part of it, um, uh, an effort by researchers at Google, well, researchers at Google did this and then we independently did this, recognizing that there are other threats from AI, namely that AI is easily fooled. So AI is absolutely certain that that's a peacock and that is a starfish and that uh, that is an ostrich and that is a, also an ostrich. Um, there's also the issue of fake news. Our enemies can make it look like anyone is saying anything at any point in time, even if they would never say those things. So, uh, for instance, they could have me say things like, President Trump is a total and complete dipshit. Now, you see, I would never say these things, at least not in a public address, but someone else would. Someone like Jordan Peele. This is a dangerous time. Moving forward, we need to be more vigilant with what we trust from the Internet. Just because I want to be bipartisan, I'll have uh, somebody doing the same to George Bush. The idea here is that now that computers can synthetically generate fake media, that, and it's cheap and easy for anybody to do that because these tools are easily usable by the general public, you can have somebody making videos like the ones you see here, generating fake images, entirely fake news articles, maybe even entirely fake news websites, news broadcasts, etc. It's going to be very difficult to figure out what's real and what's not real in the world that's coming. There's also the pesky problem that we might be creating AI that's going to kill us all. I just want to quickly point out a few more things. One is that AI software, which is what I've mostly been talking about, is extremely impressive and will change the world, but it gets even more interesting when it gets coupled with hardware. So you're looking at very impressive robot hardware. The hardware is ahead of the software here. And once we pair AI that can get out and use this hardware to say pick up trash, do security uh, patrols, sp uh, investigate other birds of flocking behavior, put our dishes away, tidy our bedrooms, uh, you know, find landmines in field, we will have these robots increasingly doing a lot of the manual jobs that are out there in the world such as pitch, picking crops. Uh, we had some work out of my lab at the University of Wyoming with great, uh, actually it was with collaborators in INRI in France, and I participated in it, that was on the cover of Nature in which a robot learned to adapt. And the reason I want to show this to you is because I want to point out that it's not just tasks that you program the robot to do that will be automated, but the robots can adapt and be flexible out there in the real world. So here is a robot that we wanted to be able to adapt to damage. This is the original programmed gate for this six-legged robot. It ha operates at this speed and goes straight. Once the leg becomes damaged, you realize that the original gate is very curved and it no longer works fast. So the robot is now damaged and it has to adapt to figure out how to continue to operate despite the damage that it suffered. And I want to call your attention to this clock right here. It used to be the case that it might take uh, you know, tens or you know, hundreds of hours for a robot to learn to compensate for such damage. But in this work, we show that it's possible in about a minute or two. In this example, it will only be 30 seconds. So what the robot is doing is it's conducting a handful of experiments 
experiments trying out entirely different families of gates. It's a very intelligent process by which, just like you would, you try one style of walking if you become injured. If that doesn't work, you try a different style of walking. And in a couple of seconds, you've figured out how to walk despite some injury and limp out of the forest. So here, after only 26 seconds, the robot has recovered a new gate that is virtually straight and almost the exact same speed as the original. And it's now can soldier on with its mission or at least limp back to a repair station and be repaired. So I want people in this room to start thinking about planning for the AI revolution that's happening. I think that AI is the current big thing. We already see companies investing tremendous amounts of money and rapid advances and industries being disrupted. But I also want you to stretch your imagination and also recognize that AI is going to be the next big thing because it's only going to get better, exponentially so, with more research and more computation and more investment. So the pace of innovation is jaw-dropping. Literally every week I am blown away even though I do this for a living and have been doing it for like 20 years now, almost everyone like Bart and myself in the field, we are surprised on a weekly basis by the innovations that are coming. So I think it's a safe bet that AI will continue to exponentially improve and we need to be thinking about that as policymakers and leaders and business people. So I want you to encourage you to think about what your AI strategy is, uh, which jobs and business sectors will disappear, what happens when they do, what opportunities will be created by AI and what you should do to capitalize them or help others to capitalize on them. So, in conclusion, the economic and scientific AI gold rush is on and will only accelerate. In the current time, we have very good AI. Soon we'll have great AI and robots that will impress you. And in the future, we will have human or superhuman level AI and robotics woven throughout our society. This will revolutionize every single scientific field and economic sector. It creates, creates tremendous opportunities and threats for societies and the labor force, and therefore we collectively need to spend a lot of time thinking about a good AI strategy to compensate for that, and that's exactly why we're here this weekend. So I look forward to learning from the discussion. Thank you. Okay. You know,